Welcome to the Creative Community. I'm your host, David Starkey, and my guest this time is poet Ron Alexander. Welcome. Thank you. Um, it's been quite, quite an adventure getting you here. <laughs> <laughs> it has been. The last time I almost made it here. Yeah, so I'll, I'll briefly recount for our, our viewers. Um, we were going to interview you a few months ago, and, um, and you've I was in a hurry. You you were you <laughs> I was hurry. rushing. Yeah, you were rushing. We were running late, ironically. So uh, I didn't need to rush. Yeah, you didn't need to rush, but um, we had to cancel the show. I took you to the emergency room. I slipped coming in the door and yeah. uh, ripped a hamstring and yeah. have been. You, you called the next month. Are you ready? And no, not yet. Yeah, I kept calling every, every. I'm still every in month. physical I'm, therapy like, for no, it. No, 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 no. And, and finally, um, we we're had here. You. Yeah, we we had you here. Yeah. Um, so. Ron, I would love to um, to first hear about you know how you got started as a poet because it's been as we were saying probably ten years since the last time you yeah. were, you were on yeah um, how did how did that happen well um, I wrote in college and um, I showed some after I graduated to a uh, composition professor that I had and I don't remember what that professor said but whatever they said. I didn't write for 25 years, wow. <laughs> so it's a long time. Yeah, so it was very discouraging. It was discouraged. I think it was less than magnanimous praise, uh -huh. and I was I had a tender ego, and I you was, needed the the, I the needed, full I needed the, everything. The full Monty. You are the new E. Cummings right, or something, right. you know, uh -huh. and um, that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, what happened was um, in 1987, I tested positive for HIV in, right. in 1995. I uh, had AIDS, and uh, but that was the year the med new medications came out. Mm -hmm. I started doing much better, and my best friend, who was a writer, said, "Well, if you're not going to die, you should write." Mm -hmm. And I started writing again, and we wrote a novel together. But I would go to these workshops on, and then writing conferences, and I'd sneak away to the poetry <laughs> workshops, oh, okay. and that's how I got back into poetry. And a class at City College right. with your peer uh, Terry Alhand. Oh yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. She was very helpful. So uh, that's that's funny. When you you just knew the the novel doesn't suit my talents, or how did you? Well, we finished the book. Uh -huh. It's still unpublished, right. but um, uh, I'll talk. Actually, I'll talk about that in a minute because I, I wrote a poem about this. But he died, uh -huh. and um, I said I would uh, uh, publish that. But that was the last I did. I kind of tailed off at mm -hmm. the end, not working so much. But it was like coming home for me mm -hmm. because I had written, like as I said, in college and afterwards. Um, so that's what it was like. And then I took a class with you, mm -hmm. um, and, but really probably most significantly after Terry was uh, working with t um, Perry Longo, mm -hmm. um, who was, uh, had a group running at Tospice. My dad had died. And um, so that's how I got started. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Perry Longo has been an inspiration to so many of I us. I bet she comes up in yeah, this conversation she, a lot. It's <laughs> probably a, a Santa Barbara poet who has not been touched. It would be hard to find one. Yeah. Um, well, let's let's jump in and, and, and hear some poems. Um, and uh, I'd love to let you, you know, just wow us with what you got. You know, I'm thinking about, just thinking about why I got started, how I got started, and my dad. I thought maybe I would read a poem that I wrote as he was advancing in life. Mm-hmm. Um, it's called Cold Tea. He does not read the newspaper anymore. He dislikes bad news and fears advice columnists. Comic strips make him uneasy. He can't tell what is real. He says his life is like a grainy film strip with a soundtrack that skips. He calls you on the phone. You tell him to get out of the house. He hangs up wraps packing tape over his mouth to muffle the screams and hides in the closet. You want to help him, but know that if you go to his house, he will deny he called. He will explain the unopened newspapers, 
the clocks, faces pasted over, papered over, and all his belongings in boxes, alphabetized, acorn, squash, acrylic sweaters, autobiographies, and so on. Afraid to boil water, he will offer you cold tea, but when he brings it, the cup will be empty. He will remind you not to burn your fingers. Mm -hmm. I wrote that after I'd been writing for a while um, because I was nervous about writing poems that were a little um, disjointed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, poems that were somewhat abstract. Okay. But I really enjoyed doing that. It's a lot of them. Well, yeah, I was going to say, I think, uh, you know, this poem notwithstanding, I, yeah. I think of you as a poet who gets an idea, kind of like Frank O'Hara maybe, and, um, and runs here and runs there and you know, yeah. sort of goes every which way. Yeah, yeah. I do feel like that's, that's what happens. Um, but this is something different. This was, yeah, no, this was, this was definitely, uh, I think, a part of that. Mm. This was a part of that. And uh, um, yeah, we'd had a, uh, I, I would say, an uneven relationship. I mean, it was, it was, it was very good at some times and mm -hmm. not so at other times. Mm -hmm. And um, but, um, but in the end, we, we seem to have found a connection. Connection. Yeah. 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 That's so important. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think that's one of the things that, that poems do for us, right? I mean, yeah. I know, particularly when you're writing a poem about or for a specific person, yeah. it really feels like a mission to either connect to that person or to articulate your own feelings about, about that individual, right? I, for me, it helps me find out what those feelings oh, are. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know? So you're still exploring. I'm it. still. I feel like I write to find out who I am and mm -hmm. why I'm here and mm -hmm. what I, what I'm doing here. Mm -hmm. uh, the story I started. I was telling you. Really, it uh, it continued because I'm one of uh, I don't know. I don't know how many thousands there are, but uh, long-term AIDS survivors. Right. And I just turned 70 last year, you which did, is yeah. kind of a miracle yeah. for me <laughs> and for a lot of other right, people. Right, right, right. Yeah. I had, a, I had, my brother's a physician, and we had a discussion about this. It was kind of a struggle because he kept insisting that AIDS had been a real medical miracle in terms of how fast they had found a treatment for this disease they just discovered. Mm -hmm. That's from his perspective. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and for me, it was like, it took too long. Right, right. And then I realized what his perspective was, which was, he had a brother with AIDS. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about that. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of friends who died, sure, and he did not have that. So it's funny how people can come to this mm -hmm. very different perspectives mm -hmm. on the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, do you, you know, living on this cocktail of, of, yeah. of drugs, do, do you feel, does mortality feel further away than it might for Somebody else, or I mean, it's hard to probably judge. Well, that. it's yeah, hard to tell. What, uh, but I would say that I have been struggling since turning seventy with this. Now realizing that you know my life is shortened. I mean, there is there is only a limit. Anybody's time. life would be shortened. Anybody's yeah, right, life yeah, is. Yeah. So it's like reconciling that with my thinking for many years that I was going to die. Mm -hmm. So at seventy now, I'm finally thinking, oh. I, maybe I should start planning a life. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's never too late. It's never too late. That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah. Let, let's hear another poem. Yeah. I, I want to make sure yeah. that we hear yeah. a lot of your um, work today. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, you asked me to bring this. Because I did, yeah. Tell you, people what this is. Yeah. You um, hosted a reading, a wonderful reading on... Um, uh, it was about uh, well, last summer. Was it last summer, uh, spring, something? Was it, or was it even in the fall? It, I don't, I know, don't know when it was, but but there were a number of um, little libraries on State Up Street, on State Street yeah. designed as these iron um, uh, punctuation marks. Right. And you had us read in alphabetical order. So Alexander, I was first, like in kindergarten. And you got the first uh, elementary, elementary school. You got the first mailbox. I got the first <laughs> mailbox. So I, I uh, started by contributing two books to it, which right. were, I think, uh, uh, God's Little Acre. Right. And uh, I forget the other one. But um, And then I'd made up my own, which I was right. going to deposit in all right. of them. But I was at the last minute right. printing them up. And I made a booklet out of it and started, and was going to put some in some of the, them. So... 
It's called The Invention of Everything, A History of the World in Six Days. Um, the Invention of Everything, A History of the World in Six Days by Ron Alexander, Tiny Library Kiosk Publications, Santa Barbara, California. <laughs> Uh, it also has a page of copyright information and all that <laughs> stuff. So. The Invention of Everything, A History of the World in Six Days. Monday starts 10 to 20 billion years ago. Nothing happens. Nada. Zip. Then everything, and it needs space. Space is invented. Time as well. As is matter, essential to the creation of root vegetables, gluten-free comestibles, and tiny library kiosks. Someone makes gravity for keeping your keys where you leave them. Books stay put, too. Tuesday starts 3.3 billion years ago. Watson and Crick invent DNA in England and win Nobel Prize. Takes them 3.5 billion years to figure out what it looks like. Cells invented, just cell cells, not iPhones and jihadis, they come later. That's about it for two and a half billion years. Wednesday starts about one billion years ago. Little creepy, squirmy things are invented. No one remembers why. Must have seemed like a good idea at the time. Thursday starts 550 million years ago. Crabs invented, and they are everywhere. Sex invented, finally. At first, only worms do it, then bees, then Cenozoic fleas. <laughs> Popularity of sex grows. Everyone wants one, like Teslas and low-interest mortgages. Everyone wants to know, what is it? How does it work? How do I get mine? Some tiny library kiosks stock texts that explain it all. Many have objectionable pictures. They go fast. Oh, this is We're going to skip Friday. Okay. We're skipping Friday and going right to Saturday, which starts 300 million years ago. Frogs invented tend to be grouchy, next fire, then pots for making gruel, gruel invented, highest rated, most widely used recipe book of all time, New York Times bestseller for over 3,000 years, The Joy of Gruel, Julius Caesar and Marco Rubio invented, Santa Barbara renamed Palm Springs of the Pacific, nights consistently balmy 137 degrees, White House moves to Crimea, nicer climate, closer to France. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I, you know, I, I remember when um, you were reading that, and um, I had told everyone, you have a three-minute um, window to, to read, you know, because it was tiny library. <laughs> so it was tiny, 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 tiny reading. And, and you started mm. reading the history of the world, and you, and you said, three billion years ago, and I was like, holy cow. And I was kind of going like that. I too. remember you doing I was, that. <laughs> I was trying to cut it down, so that's funny. Well, and, and, you know, I inadvertently just called tiny libraries tiny post offices, but I think there's a certain connection between those things, you know. There, um, oh, yeah. you're, you're sending a message to... Um, to whomever, and, and you were kind of... Or sitting, receiving. Yeah, receiving or a message, receiving. And, and this was for readers who had picked this up. And, yeah. and this is, you know, this sort of a comic, but at times sad yeah. history of the, yeah. the universe, exactly. not just the world. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, my, my whole goal had been, and the libraries were taken off, which was surprising and right. un unfortunate. I would have liked to have yeah. seen them yeah. stay there for a while. Yeah, I think they got moved all around the county. So, oh, um, is that right? So uh, there was one in front of the Galita Library for a while too. So I, I think that they they well, had that's good. yeah they, they they were dispersed, but they were still around. Yeah. I mean, what in, what inspired you to try and take on such a big topic? Um, I have always been interested in uh, biology. When I was a kid, I had these a uh, room full of terrariums and uh, frogs and tarantulas and lizards and. Uh, tropical fish and everything, and I've always had that. I thought I was going to be a naturalist on the Amazon, mm -hmm. and um, and then at the uh, end of my college years, the last year, um, uh, I went to the counseling center and realized that well, did some testing and thought, oh, I could be a psychologist. Well, that would be interesting because I like doing what they were doing mm -hmm. with me and showing mm -hmm. me um, what I was capable of, mm -hmm. and so. Um, I went in psychology last couple year, and um, so, but that biology, that interest in 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 life, you maintain is always that, yeah, in, yeah right. and and uh, history of 
life. It's always and clearly, biology and psychology are, are deeply yeah. intertwined. Right? Yeah, they <laughs> certainly are. They certainly are. Yeah, Maybe sometimes yeah. more than we want them to be. <laughs> uh, you know what? That, that leads me to another ah, uh, poem. Ah, perfect segue. Actually, yeah. Uh, this one is called Lazarus Taxon. The gawky lobe-finned coelacanth, ancient man-sized fish thought long extinct, his oily carcass having canoodled with pelagic dinosaurs, their pet petrif petrified remains entombed in sea-bottom strata 400 million years old, lives even now at the bottom of the Indian Ocean, haunts deep seafloor trenches gorging his way through the millennia, tiny fish brain encased in an oversized wad of fat, grotesque, inedible, no useful function or talent. He might as well have died off in the great extinction. Watch now as he flops on the blood-stained deck surrounded by shouting shoeless fishermen, a dying sphinx, belching finally from his slimy, gasping mouth, his Devonian secrets. Oh, wow, great last line. And what an unlikely <laughs> subject for a, for a poem. Well, I, I, my, parent, my grandparents kept these uh, uh, National Geographics, uh -huh. and there was a picture of this African fisherman pulling up this huge right. coelacanth, because they were the people who discovered this thing, right. and it had been not known for, they thought it had died 40 million years ago. Yeah. So, um, it always stuck in my head, uh -huh. and they actually have one at the, at the L.A. Museum of Natural History. Oh, okay. um, you know, uh, uh, not alive, right. but uh, but that was always. And it took me several months to realize this poem was about myself. I, I was going <laughs> to ask you that there's. It, a, it took it a long like time. There Something that lived hints, past yeah. when they thought it was right, going right, to be dead. Right, right, you know, yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, it took a. But but it didn't, it didn't say. You know, I wasn't ready to get it, I right. guess. Well, and, and I, I think it's it's so much more powerful for the fact that you don't ever actually come out and say that. Yeah. And, and then um, whatever your own Devonian <laughs> secrets are that you're going to divulge, <laughs> it's kind of the poem itself. I think know? they come at the very end. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Um, well, let's let's hear another one. We're, yeah. we're, we're having a, a, a poetry reading for folks just joining us. This, of course, is Ron Alexander, uh, Santa Barbara poet. And um, what are you going to read next? It's called Dark Matter. Um, there's also the, uh, a very strong political side to myself mm -hmm. um, coming out. I just uh, listened to um, Anita Hill last night. Oh, okay. Yeah. And she had a, a great message tying a lot of uh, issues together uh, in terms of the whole issues of LGBT issues mm -hmm. and um, the uh, assault of women and things like that. And um, so this actually deals with that. Dark matter. Scientists dive down to the bottom of the earth in galleons, sails unfurled, to draw mercator projections of particles smaller than mites, to discern among the emeralds and amethysts a material ubiquitous but invisible, as visible as luna moths in sunlight, dark matter, a substance they believe holds the universe together, the superglue that keeps us and everything else from drifting away, piece by disintegrating piece, dissolving into the celestial void from which we came, the force, no doubt, that has kept us, too, from spinning away from each other for the last 25 years, because, of course, Two men, it cannot be love. Mm, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, again, there's this whole historical ship kind of thing mm -hmm. and science in it, mm -hmm. um, but ending kind of with a turn. Mm -hmm. um, well, and, and a turn towards love. I yeah. Mean, it, it, yeah. We think of yeah, dark matter as holding everything together as being by far the largest uh, That's right. uh, element uh, that the, is out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I love the, your, your knack for being able to turn a metaphor like that into something that really has a, a moving into it. So, that, you know, you're not just working metaphor for its own sake or to show how clever you are, but it's, it's in service of something larger. It's funny how when you're writing, you, you're going someplace with a poem, you think, 
and then you end up somewhere else because mm -hmm. the end didn't come to me mm -hmm. until I was finishing the poem mm -hmm. and I realized what I was writing about. There's this mysterious thing that happens between the mind and the hand, you know, that goes without the consciousness, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. What else have you got aboard? We, got to, we have about uh, seven minutes or okay. so left. Okay, all right. So let me, um, okay. Uh, the man who was my best friend who told me to write, uh, I've known for 40 years, and, um, and I survived. And then 13 years ago, he got cancer. Mm -hmm. And last year, um, he died. And um, this is, I wrote this just before he died. Okay. Wikipedia history and some. The Treaty of Jaffa was signed in 1192, ending the Third Crusade. The Great Fire of London broke out in 1666. The Tianjin incident, whatever that was, occurred in 1856, and Union forces entered Atlanta in 1864. Keanu Reeves and Selma Hayek were born in 1964 and 1966, respectively. Ho Chi Minh and J.R.R. Tolkien died in 69 and 73 on September 2nd, like all these events. Stephen Dunn and Troy Donahue also died on September 2nd in 1977 and 2001, as will my friend of 40 years, David Bennett. Sometime, he says, this Sunday afternoon, in the early afternoon of September 2nd, 2018, if he follows through with his intentions, which he usually does. It will also be National Blueberry Popsicle Day. Mm. The forecast promises clouds. David had, uh, at the end, um, I'd gone up to visit him and um, um, who turned out to be his last month. So he, he did follow through. He followed through. He took the medication to mm -hmm. kill himself. I happened to be, I was there and happy. I was so glad I was there. Mm -hmm. It was a gift, actually, mm -hmm. to be able to be there. Yeah. And, um, yeah, but it's a huge loss for me. Well, poetry talking about so many important things, as, as yours are. I mean, uh, that's something that you, you really seem to want to, to do it. And, and, and I, again, I admire your work in that while both that poem and the previous poem were political, I don't feel like I'm listening to a, a, a commercial uh, or a propaganda ad. I, I feel like the, the poetry is the primary thing, but the, yeah. the political message is kind of in the DNA. Yeah. The, yeah, yes, in the DNA. We, I, we, I want to pause just for a minute yeah. to, to talk a little bit about our um, our community. So that our, this show is called The Creative Community. Yeah. It, it, in its two iterations now, it's been around for, gosh, 17 years or something wow. like that. Um, and in part, that's because I think here in our tiny little town on the central coast of California, we have so many creative people, and those creative people in general really seem to care about the success of other people. Would you say that that's true? I would. Um, and especially, I, would. I think, in our particular community, which is poets. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't know how you feel, but um, I, I feel like knowing other poets are around there, it gives me uh, encouragement. Um, when I'm feeling blue about my mm. latest rejection or something like that, I, I know I can go to a poetry reading and, and, and be uplifted. And, 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 you know, it's just great to see you. And I, I may not see yeah. you for a couple of months, but then yeah. I'll see you and I'll feel happy because there's, yeah. <laughs> there's Ron. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I feel that way about a lot of other people. I'm sure yeah. you do too. Well, you were instrumental in my actually coming out as a poet <laughs> because um, uh, I was invited, after six months of writing, as I mentioned right. earlier, um, uh, Carol DeCanio had the um, Santa Barbara Poetry Series at that time, right. and she couldn't be there, and you hosted right. me with Polly B. And yeah, I yeah. remember that. Yeah. Yes. That was great. Yeah. So it, it, it is, I mean, I, I, think it's, I think it's important. We think of poetry, and, and it ultimately is a real solitary activity, you and the page and the words on the, the, or the screen. But um, the, the energy behind that is, is a real communal one. Yes. Yeah, for me, there's that, and then there's the piece where you take it to a group of poets right. and you read it, and they say, "Here's what I heard," and you realize maybe it wasn't what you meant to right, say, right, right. and you can make some corrections and adjustments yeah. and things. But that's, yeah, that's really important. Too, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, we're talking about poetry, so um, <laughs> let's let's hear it. Let's what do we have now? And how much time do we have? Um, we've got Probably about one. four minutes. Oh, good. All right. Yeah. So so let me uh, let me read. Um, that uh, here I'm going to take time. Um, this is, I've been writing uh, not only um, 
well, prose poems, but they're kind of stories, and I have not known what to do with them, or, but this is one I particularly like, okay. called Stumped. The crew of the grimy trawler on which I was hiding found me in the gal galley, swiping an orange, and dragged me to the captain. He said they used to hang stowaways and thieves, but such cruelties were no longer allowed. Instead, the boatswain cut off my hand, which turned into a silver dove shot into the sky and caught the dimming light. From where the bird disappeared in roiling gray clouds, lightning exploded, struck just off the bow. Water sizzled, dolphins leaped from the sea, a thunderous crash rumbled from above and shook the boat, knocking everyone to the deck but me. The captain and crew could not move fast enough, dove into the sea and swam towards Africa. I bound up my stump and sailed the boat to Cyprus. I lived another 200 years without that hand. I never questioned losing it. Somehow I'd always known it was trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I, you yeah. know, we, we, in, our, in our short time that we have left, I would love to um, hear you read a, a real short poem, and then I want to ask you a question for some advice for other poets. Do you have a, do you I have a shortish I think this one? is pretty shortish. All right, Okay. This is after a poem by Rilke, and there are two... Um, Epigrams. It's called Peon to the Day. Atta I tackle the day that greets. And that's by Rilke. Uh, and what I heard was myself singing and singing what it knew, which was Denise's response to Rilke. And this is my response to both of them. Poised at the precipice, the swimmer takes his mark. A terrible clamor fills my ears. And the dawn, fire is the apocalypse, ignites the edges of the city. Children rise from their desks to claim the moment. One crosses oceans, posts for the photograph, snug between the new husbands who give themselves one to the other. A chain of brilliant pelicans skims the swell of surf. The sea resembles an illuminated manuscript. And I, trembling, abiding no religion, commit to the only task there is. I breathe. Mm, that's great. Well, Ron, the, the one question I'm going to ask you is in one sentence, what, uh, what piece of advice would you give to aspiring poets? Tough. Trust silence. yourself and yeah. listen to others. Trust yourself and listen to others? But trust yourself first. But trust yourself first. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, Ron Alexander, it has been a real pleasure once again to have you on the show. Thank you so much Thank for being so here much, after David. a, a long great. journey. <laughs> yes. The Creative Community is a co-production with Caps Media in Ventura. It's also sponsored by a very generous grant from the Diana and Simon Robb Foundation. I'm your host, David Starkey, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, right there, right there. Right there.